The crazy underappreciated Edge of Tomorrow just turned three years old, and wouldn't you know it, it's even getting a sequel. Yep, real dumb title too. Live, die, repeat, and repeat. Yeah, we're gonna have to talk about titles quite a bit on this one, so let's go ahead and get started. Here's a spoiler warning, folks. It's time to ask, what's the difference? So first up, the aforementioned title business. Doug Liman's 2014 film Edge of Tomorrow was later changed to Live, Die, Repeat when it was shipped out on Blu-ray. Hence the super dumb sequel title that will probably change too. But neither one of the film titles matched the source material it was based on. That title is All You Need Is Kill. Hiroshi Sakuruzaka's 2004 Japanese light novel, which is an illustrated style of novel aimed at teens, was then itself translated into a manga, a full-on graphic novel. So there are a handful of versions of the story floating around, but the one we're dealing with is the manga version published in early 2014 because for one, the manga leaves out only superficial details from the original light novel, and two, the manga's artwork is just real cool. So that's what we're doing. So let's start with the first and most obvious difference, Tom freaking Cruise. He plays Major William Cage, an army PR man with a flashy smile and absolutely zero spine. He had an advertising firm before the war broke out and joined up as a publicist specifically to avoid fighting. Can't stand the sight of blood, not so much as a paper cut. <laughs> When we first meet him, he's making the talk show rounds, drumming up support for the latest innovation in jacket technology, which is going to win the war. Or at least that's what he's selling. The main character in the manga, however, is Keiji Kiria, a young Japanese soldier, probably in his early 20s, maybe even a teenager. There are two similarities between Cruz's William Cage and Keiji Kiria. One, their names sound a little bit alike. In fact, Keiji's developing skill in combat ultimately earns him the nickname Killer Cage, which sounds even closer to William Cage. And two, they're both nervous rookies about to enter their first day in combat. The other main character is, of course, Rita Vertasky. In the movie, Emily Blunt's character is known as the Angel of Verdun and is almost single-handedly responsible for humanity's lone victory against the Mimics, which is the driving force behind the balls-out offensive the United Defense Force is currently planning. The manga Rita, which sounds like a pretty good drink when I say it out loud, is a younger, childlike American girl who's earned the nickname the Valkyrie. And she doesn't have just one victory under her belt. She's traveled around the globe with US Special Forces Forces, helping out wherever it's needed. One similarity to her movie counterpart, they're both also known as Full Metal Bitch, a nickname that's way less fitting of the teenaged manga Rita than of the battle-hardened movie Rita. Bloody hell, it's the Full Metal And if there's a third main character, I suppose it would have to be the Mimics. In both the book and the movie, they're an alien race with the ability to loop time, an ability they use to never lose a battle. In the movie, they're portrayed as swirling, tentacled monsters that jump and jitter their way around the battlefield shooting fiery orange rockets. The manga mimics, which sounds like a pretty good Halloween costume when I say it out loud, are giant spherical creatures with pointy appendages, creepy little eyes, and giant mouths that fire javelin-like rounds that just absolutely destroy dudes. The manga does offer more detail on the mimics, describing their process of chewing up earth and drinking the water, only to barf it back out in a form the mimics find more hospitable, which is, you know, super gross. <laughs> Getting into the plot, Edge of Tomorrow opens with a news montage detailing the fight against the Mimics, which started in Germany five years prior to the events of the movie. The aliens have spread through Europe and are currently being held back at the English Channel. In this flurry of news clips, not only do we meet PR coward William Cage, but we also learn about Emily Blunt's read of Ratasky and how she's become an ass-kicking Uncle Sam poster child for Hope, and Cage is all too happy to use her. Meanwhile in the manga, the battle against the Mimics is more global, with the bulk of the action taking place on the southern coast coast of Japan, and it's been going on for much longer than it has in the movie. The story opens with Keiji dying and Rita Vrataski standing over him, asking an innocent question about green tea and promising Keiji, I'll stay with you until you die. But Keiji wakes up in the barracks the night before the invasion, thinking it was all a dream. So while the manga begins with Keiji already stuck in his loop, we live with Bill Cage for a full day before he gets into the battle. He tries to literally run away from his CO, gets kicked around by the fantastic Bill Paxton, rest in peace. Tomorrow morning you will be baptized, born again and doesn't even learn how to turn his gun's safety off before getting thrown into action on the beaches of northern France, where he dies after blowing up a claymore mine and getting his face melted off by the blood of an alpha mimic. It's only then that he wakes up into his first loop. Ah! In both the movie and the manga, Cage and Keiji live through a few loops before they truly believe what is going on. For Keiji in the manga, on his fourth loop, he borrows his buddy's handgun and kills himself, waking up in his bunk immediately. 
Or moments earlier, I guess, technically. Point is, it's the fifth loop that gets Keiji determined to see this through. He even starts keeping track of his loops by writing their numbers on the back of his hand. For Cage, it's less clear how many loops he goes through. In fact, throughout the film, Doug Lyman uses this lack of clarity to shift the dynamic between Cage and Rita in very interesting ways, often within individual scenes. However, after a few loops, Cage is just determined to get off the beach, and his plan is to track down the Angel of Verdun herself to help him. And when he shows that he knows exactly what's going to happen and when, Rita immediately recognized the ability, saying, come find me when you wake up, and setting Cage off in a new direction. On your feet, maggots! Keiji in the manga, beginning with his fifth loop, is just determined to kill a mimic. He begins training with his sergeant every loop, in a similar way to Cage's training with Rita in the movie. At this point in the manga, we also get a similar trial and error montage, seeing Keiji quickly progress from loop 12, to 47, to 99, to 123, to 154. Along the way, he attracts Rita's attention during a fight in the cafeteria, in which he's clearly one step ahead of his opponent. The cafeteria fight does introduce an idea in the manga that's absent from the movie completely. Keiji is experiencing this fight for the first time and is still able to predict and anticipate his opponent's moves. Unlike a similar scene from the movie, Keiji has not lived this day before, implying whatever powers he's inherited from the mimics allow him to break down time at will, not just memorize a sequence of events through repetition. It's soon after this cafeteria fight that Rita finds Keiji on the battlefield, who at this point is doing an excellent Rita Vertasky impression, having watched her fight over and over again, even using one of her trademark battle axes. But it's not until this point, halfway through the manga, that Rita finally reveals she knows what Keiji is going through. The second half of the manga kicks off with a ton of Rita's backstory, something we get none of in the movie. None that's reliable, anyway. Well, maybe I made it all up just to keep you quiet. Manga Vertasky, which sounds like a super indie foreign film director when I say it out loud, grew up in Illinois and, get this, her name isn't Rita Vertasky at all. On the pages of the manga, her name is actually blacked out, and we never find out what it is. When mimics show up to her quiet childhood home, both her parents die in the attack, leaving her orphaned and super angry. Too young to join the United Defense Force, she stole a passport from a refugee named Rita Vertasky, and signed up to kill as many mimics as possible. It's also this section of Rita backstory where the manga details how the time loop works by following Rita quickly through her first loops. In the battle to retake the Florida Peninsula, she kills a mimic with an antenna and begins looping immediately. Once she figures it out, she equates the mimics to a network with servers and backups, and sets out to destroy the network by killing certain mimics in a certain order. And she does after 211 loops. This is not super different from the movie, where the specialized mimics are referred to as alphas and omegas, but one key difference is how they pass on their time loop ability. In the movie, it's in Cage's blood, having been doused with it when he died the first time and began looping. In the manga, it's tachyon particles emitted by the server mimics that change Rita and Keiji's brain chemistry. However, in the movie, Rita loses her power after Verdun, which is how she stopped looping and in fact, warns Cage that's the only rule. If you start to die, you better finish dying. Otherwise, you're out. In the manga though, Rita breaks the loop after killing the network of mimics in Florida, and because her brain has been altered, she keeps the power. This allows her to travel around the world, going through battles, then looping backwards to change the strategy used by the United Defense Force. She also allows herself to be studied and utilized as a weapon in the manga, something expressly forbidden by movie Rita, which sounds like a nickname for a girl named Rita who refuses to watch TV when I say that out loud. Both the film and manga spend some time developing the one-sided relationship that develops between our two heroes. In the movie, we see Cage trying desperately to keep Rita safe until he kills the Omega Mimic so she can make it out of the loop alive as seeing her die over and over again begins to take a toll. In the manga, they stay up all night talking and enjoying having somebody to share the brutal looping experience with. However, as the manga nears the end, Keiji and Rita work seamlessly together to take down the network of mimics in Japan. And as Keiji deals the final blow to kill the mimic server, he wakes up in his bunk again, still stuck in the loop. Meanwhile, in the movie, just when Cage thinks he's found the Omega, he discovers it's a trap. Being led by visions to a dam in the mountains of Germany, he realizes it was all a ruse used by the mimics to find him and take their power back, which is the same thing that happened to Rita at Verdun, which he now sees was all part of the mimic plan to give mankind hope and lure them into an all-out attack in which the mimics can take out all of our forces at once. Dastardly. So, moving into what is essentially the third act of the manga, as Keiji and Rita try to take down the network for the second time, Rita suddenly attacks Keiji. She realized that when the tachyon particles adapted their brains, they themselves became antenna mimics, and so long as they're both alive, they'll never get out of this loop. She forces the two of them into a fight to the death that ultimately Keiji wins. He then moves on to slaughter the rest of the mimics and earn a victory in Japan. 
The movie takes a longer route, with Cage and Rita going back to London to get a device that will help them locate the real Omega, which they find underneath the Louvre in Paris. However, when their escape doesn't go smoothly, Cage loses his powers. I can't reset the day anymore. Ultimately, without the safety net of time looping, they fight their way into Paris, knowing they won't make it out alive. But when Cage blows up the Omega and once again gets all gooped up in alien blood, he wakes back up. This time, two days prior instead of just one. He also wakes up to find that a mysterious power surge from Paris has essentially wiped out all the mimics across Europe earlier that morning, two days before Cage blows up the Omega underneath the Louvre, which is weird. Maybe that's the day the Omega kept resetting to, so when Cage reset with the Omega's blood, that's when he went back to as well? I don't know, there are a handful of theories about how that works, not the least of which is the studio wanted a happy ending. Either way, the manga ending is at the very least a cleaner ending. After Keiji destroys the last of the Japanese mimic network, he spends time mourning the loss of Rita, whom he'd grown to care for a great deal. He even paints his jacket sky blue in her honor because it was her favorite color. But instead of killing all the mimics, yay, happy ending, Keiji takes Rita's place with the US Special Forces team. He still has his looping ability, and the war against the mimics is still very much ongoing. So at the end of the day, we've got an adaptation that is ultimately very Hollywoodified. The main character goes from being a kid to an adult who goes from coward to hero. The bad guy's motives are less clearly defined in the movie. The mechanics are simpler in the movie. Swapping out tachyon particles changed the physicality of my brain for alien blood got in me. And the day is saved, even if it's saved in a difficult to understand way. And that's not to say it's a bad thing. Like we said at the very top, this is a crazy underappreciated movie. All you need is kill is simply the darker, more tragic take on the story, and they're both really cool. Well, here's hoping they come up with a better title for the sequel than Live, Die, Repeat, and Repeat. But in the meantime, be sure to subscribe to Cinefix for more What's the Difference? What the hell were you thinking?